What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Mac on Sports Podcast. And the Boston Bruins are officially on to the next round. I couldn't be more happier on this Sunday, May 23rd night. It's an electric night for many reasons. May 23rd is the night fans and sports were officially back. Now, you might say, yeah, but sports and fans have been back for a while. Maybe not at 100 capacity, but they've been back. What are you talking about? Well, it all starts, let's just, before we get to the Bruins, let's jump in with Phil Mickelson here, guys. Phil Mickelson wins the PGA Championship, which is a major, one of the big majors in golf. Now, shout out, Phil. Shout out, Phil. He surpasses Julio Borrios um, as the oldest major champion of all time. I believe Phil Mickelson came into this week definitely, I think, I think he was like ranked 115th in the world out of all the pro golfers in the world. That's the lowest by any major champion since a guy in 2003, 2002, something like that. Huge. Nobody, I saw so many bets. I saw someone put down a uh, $1,000 bet on Phil to end up winning themselves 300 grand. It's pretty nice. Pretty nice if you're just sitting at your house watching golf. All of a sudden, oh, I'm going to put a, you know, $1,000 on uh, Phil Mickelson and win 300 grand. That's more than a lot of families make in a year. That guy's having a good day. But shout out to Phil. Shout out to Phil. Uh, my boy Brooks Kepka coming in second. Uh, Brooks unfortunately didn't win. Big uh, friend of the program there, part of my take. I was hoping he would get one. Doesn't win, but shout out to Phil Mickelson because he, he had a shot from the bunker and he made it. And it was just like, that was an unbelievable shot. And the thing with the fans on 18, security basically lost control. It reminded me a lot of Happy Gilmore. It really reminded me of Happy Gilmore, how electric it was. You had fans just going crazy for Phil. Everybody's chasing him. Everybody just basically on 18 was outside of the barriers, security, and it was just awesome. And it was good to hear the roar of the crowd. Now, that's one thing with fans. That's one thing. But I got to talk about the New York Knicks fans. Oh, my God. If you ask my two best fan sports cities in all of the United States, my number one and number two, no particular order, is Boston, without a doubt, and New York, without a doubt. Yeah, Philadelphia is good, but my top two are Boston and New York. And oh my God, the playoffs are just more fun when the Knicks are in. Maybe it's because we haven't had the Knicks in the playoffs for a very long time, but Spike Lee just going crazy before the game. You got Spike back, so that's awesome because he's a super fan, very loyal. I respect the hell out of Spike Lee because that is a loyal through and through fan. Just New York Nick crowds. You had the vaccinated side and the non-vaccinated side. I'm going to tell you what. The vaccinated side had a much more electric time than the non-vaccinated side. Uh, the crowd atmosphere is the best ever since we uh, got stuck with COVID. Like, without a doubt, that is one of the top sporting events since COVID. Because you could hear it through the TV. You could feel the energy of the place. You could feel the energy of everything that was going on. And you know what? While we're at it, we might as well just talk about the NBA here before I was going to start with the Bruins because I was really happy about that. We're not. We're going to go right to the Knicks here. Knicks-Hawks. What a game. What a game. Now, out of any NBA series, this is the closest on talent margin series I think there is. The 4-5 matchup. And let me tell you, when you're talking about Trey Young, Vern Luka Dantich, both of those guys are young. When that trade happened, they both teams won the trade. Both teams won the trade. You could say Luka's probably a little better than Trey. But it's neither team lost the trade, though. Neither team lost the trade. And let me tell you, what Trey Young did in his debut was unbelievable. 32 points, 7 rebounds, and 10 assists. Nice double-double. Three rebounds away of a triple-double. Quite nice. Quite nice. Now, uh, he's the first guy since Derrick Rose to have that type of stat line in his playoff debut. That's pretty good company back in D. Rose's prime. Pretty good company to have. He hit the game winner, too. Comes down the lane, hits a floater, and shut up Madison Square Garden. It went from an unbelievable raucous atmosphere, back and forth type of game, back and forth to Trey Young being ice cold. And he let the Knicks fans know it. And that's what I've missed too. Players letting the opposing, becoming in, becoming the villain, and then hitting a shot like that to shut up everybody. I thought that was awesome. But yes, Trey's stat line was great. Yes, he did hit a game winner for the Hawks. And I have no team, like 
I'm from Georgia, so yeah, I, I'm cheering on the Hawks a little bit, but I also love the Kentucky Knicks. I think the Kentucky Knicks are awesome as well. So I have a spot, soft spot for them. So I'm not really having a root, rooting interest. I just want good basketball, and that's exactly what we got. Alex Burks had the game of his life for the Knicks. I don't think Knicks fans would have guessed that, but he was awesome. The crowd was so good. At a timeout, Nate McMillan, the uh, Atlanta, or Atlanta Hawks head coach, was telling his team, hey, I know it's loud. I know the atmosphere's crazy. We're running a jumbled offense. Look at Trey. Take our time. Let's get into our sets. Basically complimenting the crowd in his huddle how electrifying it was. That's how good of a crowd Madison Square Garden was. And that is why on May 23rd, that's the day sports officially returned. And fans really made an impact. Really made an impact. But here's the thing. Yes, like I said, Trey had a great stat line and everything, and he hit the game winner, so he should win player of the game. But I think Bo Bo Ga, Bo yeah, Ben Donovich, Bo Donovich. I struggle with that name all the way I have for some reason. His plus minus was plus seventeen. That is so incredibly good because it was only a two point Hawk victory. He finished with eighteen points and four threes. But when he was on the floor, the Hawks team was completely different. They were a completely different team. He played absolutely unbelievable for the Hawks and hit a big-time three with under a minute left to tie the game. He was a big-time player in a big-time situation. So that's all I got to say about that. But the Hawks take game one in the Mecca, in Madison Square Garden. And oh my God, Nick fans, you guys were awesome. As a neutral, it was awesome to see. And it's good that fans are back. And if we can get a seven-game series of every single game being exactly like this one, we're in for a series. The playoffs are already off to an electric start as we had some great matchups across the board. What I really want to get into is the Lakers Suns. Now look, I know, and I'm really going to I'm I'm really going to touch on this in the Celtics versus Nets game. I really will or really will in a second, but I want to focus here before we get to that on the Suns. My point here being look, coming into the series, the 7 seed Lakers are favored over the Suns. So much disrespect to the Suns. You guys know how I have, I have such a soft spot for Phoenix. I really do. You guys know that if it's not for the Celtics, the Suns are my go-to guys as well. My favorite player in the NBA is Devin Booker, right up there with Jason Tatum. One-two punch. I've met Devin Booker plenty of times back in my early high school days. So, so nice. I've met him multiple times. Devin Booker's got a soft spot in my heart. I love D-Book. So I love the Suns. Ever since he got to the league, the Suns have became one of my teams. And I'm not. I don't take teams lightly. It, it's very hard for me to get passionate for a team, and I'm passionate for the Suns. So when I was watching this Suns-Lakers game, I got I kept having to remind myself, and I kept having to remind myself during the Celtics-Lakers, or Nets game, Mac, both your teams are underdogs. One, the Suns are playing the Lakers. You really think a small market like the Phoenix Suns are going to get calls against an LA Laker team, a big market team, and oh, heaven forbid, LeBron gets a call against him. I had to keep reminding myself that because when I was watching the Celtics Knicks, oh, it's a real shame if the Celtics somehow pull off an unbelievable upset in the first round of the playoffs against the Nets and poor Kyrie, Kevin Durant, and oh, James Harden all get sent home. We can't have those three All-Stars getting sent home. We need them in the finals. The NBA is the most rigged league, rigged league at halftime. The Lakers had 17 free throws and the Suns had zero. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Cameron Payne gets ejected. There was just a lot of stuff. And if you were a... I'm not, I'm not saying anything against the Lakers. I'm not saying anything against the Nets. It's always whoever's got the big star is going to get the call. And it's usually LeBron's teams. But what I'm saying is just make it look less obvious. In NBA basketball, the reason out of any professional sports league that I struggle with to watch is the NBA is because of the refs. Because of how much of a joke I really do think they are. They don't even try to make it obvious. No, no, they do make it obvious. They don't even try to hide it. Some of the calls they make, it's like, dude, the guy never got touched. And so, my God, every player complains about every little thing. You're in the NBA. You're a grown man. Hey, grow a pair and suck it up and be tough because some of them play so incredibly soft. But you know who doesn't play soft is Devin Booker. Shout out Devin Booker. I was just harping, talking about how good Trey Young did, which he was for his playoff debut. But a lot of people who underlook my boy Devin Booker because he's never been in the playoffs. He can't really be a superstar because he's never been in the playoffs. That's what I've heard from people. Yeah, Devin Booker, 34 points, 7 rebounds, 8 assists. That's the most by his son in a playoff debut. Have a day, Mr. Devin Booker. Not too shabby at all. And like, like I said, with Trey, I thought he was good. Player of the game, maybe. 
But Bogdanovich, he was. Well, let's look at DeAndre Ayton, because that was my player of the game for the Suns. DeAndre Ayton was my player of the game. 21 points, 16 rebounds, and missed one shot. Talk about being unbelievably efficient. That's exactly what DeAndre Ayton was. He was a beast in the post. He was a difference maker. And he was putting it to the Lakers' bigs. I mean, DeAndre Ayton had more offensive rebounds than Anthony Davis had rebounds the whole entire game. DeAndre Ayton had eight offensive boards. Anthony Davis had seven in the game. If you're a Laker fan... You have to be very worried about Anthony Davis' performance. You look at Anthony Davis, ever since he came back from his injury in April, he is 9 for 44 shooting the three. So he is 20%, 20 to 21% shooting the three ball. That's not good. I know it's all about a pick and pop game. Your bigs have to be able to shoot the rock. I understand that, but there's sometimes where it's okay not to shoot. And some bigs need to just stay in the post and just get strong and go to work down in the paint. Like DeAndre Ayton, he knows his role. He stays down in the paint. He's a beast. Anthony Davis, as much as a difference maker he is, he's unstoppable in the post. He's got to lay off the three-pointers, but he doesn't. But shout out Phoenix. Shout out Phoenix. They were the better team. If I'm a Laker fan, I'd be worried. No, no, no. Look, I know you guys lost to Portland last year, and you come back, and you you probably will against Phoenix. I feel like Phoenix is a lot different than Portland. A lot of it's a better matchup, like a tougher matchup. I actually think the Suns are l- legit. I really do think the Suns can make a run here. I know last podcast I was saying how you know it's a tough situation for the Lakers to be put in. I did pick the Suns to win this, though. I picked the Suns to win the series. And I'm gonna stay with it, but I think the Lakers will be fine because. I swear, they had an adjustment. They moved Anthony Davis to the five, and he was a completely different player. If they do that over the course of the series, they're going to be fine. But if I'm a Laker fan, what I'm worried about was the lack of heart from the Lakers, the lack of effort, getting out-toughed by the Suns. The Suns got to every 50-50 loose ball. The Suns were taking charge left and right. I mean, it's just one game, but it's something that carries over. It carries over. I'll be interested to see the game two adjustments. What's going to go on for the Lakers? Because I thought the Suns had a great, excellent game plan. I thought Monty Williams did amazing. Even with Chris Paul's injury, I thought Cameron Payne stepped up, played a decent role before he got ejected. And I think the Suns are just a good, good basketball team. Yes, Devin Booker's a star. DeAndre Ayton's a rising star. And Chris Paul's a veteran leader. But you look at the other guys, Cam Johnson, Mikel Bridges. Mikel Bridges never takes a playoff. They and Jay Crowder, they all exceed their role. That's what you need on a championship team. Go Suns. Lakers, I'm sure, will bounce back. But uh, Sixers, Wizards. This is going to be a long series. Uh, Tobias Harris played very well. 37 points. That's his playoff career high. Thought he was great. He was over 50% shooting from the field. He had a very good performance. The Wizards, they're a very hard team to watch. I'll be, that's the nicest way I can put it. They're a very hard team to watch. And um, yeah, so which now leads me to Damian Lillard, a fun team to watch. The Portland's Frail Blazers. This is a team of destiny guys that have came out of nowhere. Nobody really had high expectations for them. Will they get a six seed? They play a good matchup in Denver. Without Jamal Murray, Portland can win this. I picked Portland to win this series. Talk about a great game one. 34 points for Mr. Lillard. 13 assists. Five threes. That's the most assists by Damian Lillard in a playoff game. He came to play. Playoff game came to play, and they were great. The Nuggets were just outmatched. Portland takes game one. It's going to be a good series, though. Now leads me to the Mavericks before I get into the Celtics' next, or Nets. Luka Doncic has his third career playoff triple-double. Not too shabby at all. No other Mav player has even won. Luka's in good company. He was chirping at Patrick Beverly, telling him he's too small, which is not a guy I would necessarily want to chirp because Patrick Beverly is tough as nails. But Luka's not going to back down from anybody. Luka is carrying this Dallas team on his back. He is going to lead them on a playoff run if they go on one, all because of him. Because Porzingis, bust. He's an absolute bust in the league. They're not getting anything that they want out of him. So Luka, carry him on his back, and he just continues to do what Luka does. And Coach Carlisle, uh, he's he's a good coach, just gets Luka in good situations. And I really thought this Clipper team... It's only one game. It's a long series, guys. You can't even overreact over one game. Not even with the Suns-Lakers, guys. Don't even overreact that. Good win by the Suns, but you got to keep progressing. 
With this Mavericks, you got one on the road, which is good. Now you go, you got to try to steal game two. I'm sure the Clippers will make adjustments because Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, that team's just too talented to lose to a team like the Mavericks. But the Mavericks are a good team. You got to definitely respect them. Definitely respect them. Now, the Heat had a unfortunate loss against the Milwaukee Bucks. The Heat made 15 more three-point field goals than the Bucks and still managed to lose. That's the largest differential in three-point field goals in a playoff loss in NBA history. Tough. Tough. The Heat were lighting the they were shooting the ball well, but Milwaukee was just dominant in the paint. And Chris Middleton hits a game winner in overtime. What a game. And that was a great way to start off the NBA playoffs. But this was a decent series last year, and I'm expecting we get this to go six or seven. And I think every game is going to be close between Milwaukee and Miami. I'll be interested to see how Coach Budenholzer makes adjustments. And how uh, Eric Spolstro makes adjustments. Eric Spolstro is one of the best NBA coaches in the league, without a doubt, in Miami. So I'm sure this is going to be a good X's and O's matchup throughout the whole entire series. Which now leads me to the Celtics versus the Nets. Celtics do lose. Celtics had a lead at halftime. I told myself I wasn't going to get really pumped into this series. I expect Brooklyn to win in four. I still do. But there is something that I can get behind. When you play with heart, it makes it easy for me to cheer for you. I have absolutely zero problem, zero problem cheering for you if you play with heart. And I thought the Celtics played with an unbelievable amount of heart in game one. When Jason Tatum shoots 30%, when Kemba Walker shoots 30%, and you're in the game, most of the game, without Jalen Brown, by the way, without Jalen Brown, and Kevin Durant has to go for over 30 Kyrie has to go for over 20. James Harden gets 29. That's not bad at all. To still be in the game, down to the wire in the fourth quarter. I was so proud of this Celtics team. And I know they lost. But Robert Williams had nine blocks last night. Most by a Celtics since 1983. Have a day, Rob. But here's what pisses me off. This is, it's just been real under my skin. Really, really under my skin. We know the NBA is such a rigged league. You got You wonder why Vegas gets it close to the line every single time. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. Now, when Jason Tatum gets elbowed in the face by Kevin Durant, oh, God forbid we call that on Kevin Durant, right? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Tatum, a rising superstar, can't get a call. No, 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 no. Can't. But KD, Kyrie, Gordon Hayward, God forbid you blow a little air on them, that's a foul on you. It was, it was, you know, shocking. Brooklyn just was in the bonus way before the Celtics all game. James Harden is the best flopper. He's the best flopper in the NBA. The guy gets so many calls for flopping. His signature shot is a travel, whatever. But it's just sickening to see the refs fall for this every single time. Every single time. And what made me happy, look, I, I'm sick of Brooklyn already. I have nothing against you fans. I'm just, I'm sick of the team because I know the Stars are going to get the call. But Saturday night was a whole nother level of that. It was a whole nother level of that. It got to the point where I have now, Philadelphia, hey, we're never really on good terms. If Philadelphia meets up with Brooklyn in the Eastern Conference Finals, I will take off the Ben Simmons' trash bracelet. I will become a Sixers fan for a series. That's how much I don't like Brooklyn right now after that game. It was sickening to watch. Sickening. Like, hey, Adam Silver, can you make it maybe just a little less obvious? Because I thought it was absolutely pathetic. But I'm not going to take anything away from Brooklyn. They were the better team. I mean, if you lose to Boston, you have a real problem without Jalen Brown. When Jason Tatum shoots 30%, when Kemba shoots 30%, you got a real problem. When Marcus Smart's just taking FU threes from like half court. Boston played with heart, though. Therefore, I don't have anything against it. Now, game two, I expect Brooklyn to win. I, I still expect Brooklyn to win in four. But after hearing that New York Knicks crowd, I can only imagine what the Garden's going to be like. I can only imagine what the Garden's going to be like when it gets to 100%. I believe unless they make a minor adjustment in game four, there will be 100% capacity. Game three, they, uh, they're on the fence about it because the day, it's May 28th, game three, and uh, the full capacity goes May 29th. What difference does a day make? Come on. Let the Celtics have full capacity. But Brooklyn's going to win. In four. It was just sickening to watch. Some of the calls that are being made. The NBA's a joke. 
Like I will, I will go to my grave and saying how much the NBA is an absolute joke, but it is. The NBA officials are ridiculously bad. So I am proud of the Celtics effort and I know they lost. There's not much we can do about it, but it is what it is. Now, speaking about how fans are back and fans are electric, I went to my first sporting event ever since COVID started. The Braves game on Saturday, or yeah, Saturday. Friday night, guys, the Braves put up a 20 spot. That's incredibly hard to do in the major leagues. Incredibly hard to do in the major leagues. But I have a funny story from the game that I went to. So me and my good friend, uh, Wally, Hank Harper, we went to the game on Saturday, and the Braves played well. They get a big win. We're sitting right behind the Pittsburgh Pirates bullpen. And it was quite funny because there was a pitcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates who's from Georgia, went to Marietta High School, and he comes into the game. And the guy's family was pretty close to us, like a couple of rows behind us. And they were going crazy for their son. They're cheering him on every strike he threw. He walks Freddie, but Azunia hits him to a double play. They're going absolutely crazy. So I, I, you know, it was good to see. Good to see. Now, here's where it gets funny. I look to Hank, and I go, what are the odds Ozzy Albies hits a home run off of him? And no joke, that happened. And when I say I felt so incredibly bad for the family, I do. Because you're pitching in front of your family, and then you give up an absolute dong shot. That's tough. That's tough, but um, I did feel bad for the family because they went from super like, yay, to, uh It was a good homer by Ozzy. Braves are buzzing right now, but it's good good to be able to go to a game again, and it was a fun atmosphere, and the Braves win. I'm very sorry for that kid who gave up a homer because, uh, yeah, it was tough to see his family get sad like that, but that happened. So Braves put up 20. Boys are electric. Ronald Acuna stays the face of baseball, in my opinion, as he hits a grand slam. And then, oh my God, he hit the fast. The ball, when I was there, the ball left the park like that. Just, you could snap your finger, the ball was gone. He hit an absolute rocket and a half over 400 feet, and the ball was gone in like 0.1 seconds out of the stadium. Unreal. I love Acuna. So, now I want to get circle back to the Boston Bruins. As we were going to start the show with the Boston Bruins, how about we go with the Boston Bruins? Here we go. Here we go, boys. The Bruins win in five. I don't think anybody saw the Bruins beating the Capitals in five, but here we are. After Boston drops game one, it's like, okay, this is going to be a seven-game seven series, absolute dogfight and a half, more than likely. Um, wow. Wow. I'm so in on this team, guys. I am so in on this team. I really have – I have a slight – feeling this could team this team could win the cup and I know it's hard and I know it's only one series Washington is an unbelievable hockey team Alexander Ovechkin one of the greats of all time Sedano Chara one of the greats of all time Boston just manhandled them all series and I, I I'm so so incredibly thrilled uh we don't know who we play we play either Pittsburgh or the Islanders which guys the Bruins are buzzing David Pasternak scored an absolutely disgusting goal. Oh my God, went through the legs, deeks the tendy, and goes right in, uh, like, uh, in the paint. Oh my God, you'll have to look it up for yourself. It was filthy. This team is playing good hockey. They were a tight camaraderie team. Tuka Rass, stand on your head, pal. Tuka was having a day. Tuka had a series. I know he gets a lot of criticism, uh, after, especially after game one. I even gave him a couple because it was a little... Uh, Goals he should have scored. Let me tell you, the adjustments he made, he was phenomenal. You get a week up rest for your round two series, but let me tell you, I am so incredibly happy tonight uh, what this team has accomplished in five against Washington, and I love playoff hockey. I love playoff hockey. I love it, and I'm so happy what the Bruins are doing because they're buzzing on a whole nother level right now, guys. Bergeron scores two, and... Um, God, I cannot wait for 100% fans at the Boston games because Boston fans make a difference. And what a game, what a team, what a series. Here we go. Max buzzing. The boys are buzzing in Boston. It's a good time for hockey. It's a good time for sports. Let's go, bees. That's all I have to say. Uh, other hockey note, Colorado Avalanche swept the Blues. That was the first team to advance. They won in four. That is my Stanley Cup favorite, the Colorado Avalanche. I think they are going to win the Cup. We shall see. Now, to end it off, the hockey. Actually, two more things. There was the fans. This is my favorite story of the whole entire weekend, guys. The whole entire weekend. At the New York Islanders versus Pittsburgh Penguins game four game. Oh, my God. It was great. In the upper part of the arena, I'm talking like two rows. 
there was just a crowd filled of referees, like fans dressed up in referee uniforms. Every single time there was an icing, uh, which is still the stupidest rule in sports, and any time a penalty was drawn, the fans would all start celebrating, no matter who it was called against. They would celebrate, they would go crazy, and then they would start chanting, let's go ref, let's go ref. It was hilarious. You'll have to see the picture in the videos on social media for yourself, but that was my favorite thing. They would give the ref a standing ovation after every single call that he made. Uh, yeah, it was a good, good number amount of people in referee uniforms. That was my favorite thing of the weekend. I thought it was hilarious and uh, showing some refs some love. Refs don't get a lot of love. They have a very hard job, even though I think most of them are pretty atrocious. Really, they're pretty good at what they do, to be honest, but... That was my favorite story of the week. So, and then the Predators. Wow. You want to talk about a guy who stood on his head all game long on Sunday afternoon was the Nashville Predators goalie. He had 58 saves. 58 saves. Now, they played 97 minutes of hockey. This was two overtimes. They played 97 minutes of hockey. I'm sure the Ice Bass are doing pretty well. But the Predators, a team that was supposed to just get swept pretty bad. Hey, hey, hey. Look at you. You Look at you. They're, they're hanging around. They've taken this to five. They're balling. That's all you can say. Congratulations to the Predators. But I just wanted to get that stat out there. That guy had an absolute day and an absolute half. What a job by the Predators goalie. To rake in 58 saves. That's absolutely unbelievable. Now, my um, sad moment of the week. Sergio Aguero, like we talked about in the intro. Probably his last game with Manchester City of all time. I love Aguero. Aguero's my favorite soccer player of all time. When you grow up, you start seeing your younger generation when you were growing up as a kid. Your favorite players kind of just drift off and uh, start retiring. And it's a sad thing to see. Guero was really one of the big guys that I ever got into soccer for. And his favorite soccer moment of all time, mine, is um, the 93-20 game against QPR where he won the Premier League on a game-winning goal. Martin Tyler with the one I actually would call it the greatest sports call of all time. It's definitely up there. It gives me chills every time I listen to it. Um, his last game was Sunday with Man City. Unless he plays in the Champions League final on Saturday against Chelsea, I don't see that happening. Um, you couldn't ask for a better farewell. City hasn't had fans at their games all year in England, and they uh, opened up for fans to come in this time, celebrate with the team as they won the Premier League on Sunday, and Sergio Aguero comes in as a super sub, scores two goals. He was unbelievable. I mean, he's played 275 games for City, 184 goals, five titles. Um, just Sergio Aguero says goodbye to the Premier League, and he says goodbye to Man City, and I cannot, I can't, um, can't put into words how much he has meant to me, how as much as he's meant to the city of Manchester, city fans all around the world. Uh, Sergio Aguero is a legend. He will have a statue built, and he deserves it because Aguero is amazing. Like in his final home game against Everton on Saturday, he scored two goals. It broke Wayne Rooney's record for the most Premier League goals for a single club. He's unbelievable. You ask any City fan who their favorite player is, definitely Sergio Aguero is going to come off as one of the top choices because true player, true person, and uh, thank you everything he's done, thank you everything that you've done for the club, Sergio. So, yeah, it was emotional. Um, the PA announcer was talking about all of his accolades as he was coming onto the pitch, and I was tearing up. I was tearing up. So sad to see a legacy end, but he is now moving on and. Uh, yeah, Champions League final on Saturday. I'm super thrilled for it. Super, super thrilled. And I don't see Aguero playing in that, but it wouldn't. you can't ask for a better story if Aguero comes on and bags one late as a super sub. But yeah, that was a sad, sad part of the weekend. He's moving on from City. So yeah. Now to end the show, I want to just talk about Scooter Henderson. This kid's 17. Scooter's one of the best players in the high school rankings. This kid was a junior, going to be a senior next year. Went to Cal High School. Actually, I've mentioned Tom Lawrence a few times on this podcast. He played with Scooter uh, growing up a little bit in basketball. And Scooter is now opting out of a senior year of high school and deciding to move on to the G League. And he's signing a million dollars. Now, it's very hard for a 17-year-old to turn down one million dollars. I totally, wholeheartedly understand that. 
I do. So I can't argue this like I argue the Jalen Green decisions, the Jaden Hardy decisions of the world. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. You guys know how I feel on the G League signing these type of players. I hate it with the passion. Uh, I would have rather have seen Scooter play in the college rankings and do it for himself. But $1 million at 17, it's very hard to turn down. So I can't argue that. Um, he's going to be there for two years, though. So I hope in his mindset, he made the right decision on reclassifying and leaving, not even enjoying his senior year of high school, which is your best year of high school, and going to play against grown men. Now, I know his dream is to play in the NBA, so playing against grown men, that's going to help you out along the way. I get that, but he sounds for a million with the G League Ignite. Uh, I wish I could abolish the G League Ignite myself. Hate him with a passion, but they keep stealing these players. That's one thing, getting a 17-year-old for a million dollars. Like I said, it, being in the kid's shoes, it's hard to turn down. Now, what I hate with the passion is overtime. The social media account, everybody knows about overtime for basketball and stuff like that. They're making their own high school team, and I hate this. Two top 15 junior kids over the last couple of days have committed to team overtime. Dropped out of high school, done, done. They're going to go play for team overtime until they're eligible to go to the NBA. Okay, so let me put this in terms. You leave high school, so you don't have a high school diploma. Okay, you're gonna opt out on college. Okay, that's fine. But what if what if you get hurt? What if you get hurt? I'm sure you're getting a decent amount of money from team overtime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what if you run through your money? What if you get hurt? What if you go to the NBA, right? And end up having a career-ending injury, never being able to play basketball again. When I don't have a high school diploma because you wanted to leave when you were almost done to go to a stupid ass overtime team. I don't like this team overtime. Like I said, the NCAA needs to make a bill where these college athletes can get paid. I wish it didn't have to come to this. I wish you get your scholarship, whatever you play, but you have to, you have to adapt to these rules because you see these G League teams signing these players. You see overtime making their own league, trying to get these kids out of the college game. There has to be an adjustment and it has to be made now so we will see what happens but that's gonna wrap up the show today it was a good monday a lot of stuff to talk about we got a lot of stuff over these next couple of days hope you guys enjoyed it as much as i did i'm still buzzing from that bruins victory i'm wearing my brad marshawn shirt uh he played a great series again for marshy thought he was great and now tom wilson can go on vacation and not murder anybody on the ice so i think we can all uh, celebrate that so thank you guys Go uh, follow the social medias in the descriptions. Tell a friend, guys. Tell a friend. Let's keep spreading the podcast. I appreciate all the support messages that you guys send me of putting somebody on the podcast. So I appreciate the, that, guys. And let's keep doing it. And let's continue to get to the top. Love you guys. Peace out.